Hello, Brian Flynn, ALS EMS educator with Regions EMS. I just wanted to go over the anaphylaxis scenario and make sure you guys have all the notes available for you guys to run it successfully with your clinicians. I created this scenario with the idea in mind that I did not want the patient to have all of the classical signs of anaphylaxis. There are a few studies that have shown both pre-hospitally and in the ER. We do fairly poorly at remembering to provide epinephrine when the patient doesn't have the classic symptoms of hypotension, severe respiratory distress, and oral swelling, so lip swelling, tongue swelling, that kind of thing. So our anaphylactic patient, uh, patient, patient has a food-induced allergen. And most food-induced allergies, while they certainly can show with oral swelling and they can show with respiratory distress, it's also common to show with severe GI distress, such as vomiting and incontinence. Patient can also have altered mental status and um, uh, syncope potentially, secondary to uh, most commonly hypotension. I didn't give this patient hypotension, one, because the patient has a history of hypertension and isn't taking his medications, and two, because while hypotension is easily recognized, I wanted to have other signs of end organ failure, such as the GI distress and the altered level of consciousness, so your clinicians recognize that hypotension isn't necessitated for anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis can occur even with a patient who isn't yet hypotensive. So uh, this patient has a high heart rate, a systolic blood pressure that's lower than their heart rate, which suggests the patient is in compensated shock for something. Now you'll see in the notes, patients that have anaphylactic shock can third space or extravasate up to about a third of their entire circulating blood volume. And that can happen within 10 minutes of the patient having the uh, allergy uh, put into their system. Think about your trauma patients that have lost a third of their entire circulating blood volume. They have altered level of consciousness. They're not responding appropriately. They usually have this diaphoretic and cool skin. For your anaphylactic patient, because that fluid isn't being lost, it's just going into the third space, patients usually can end up with still sweaty but severely flushed skin, so red, maybe warm or even hot to the touch. We need to consider epinephrine. We need to consider Benadryl. We need to consider fluid because even though the fluid is still inside the patient, it's not circulating around so the patient can't utilize it effectively. Now, in this scenario, your 52-year-old male ended up eating chicken and gravy and mashed potatoes, and I put a note that uh, per one of the big food manufacturers, something they usually use to thicken up gravies, chili, tomato sauce, is peanut butter, and the patient has a peanut butter allergen. Didn't realize it was in the gravy. So after dinner, patient has GI discomfort, starts vomiting, starts pooping, has a syncopal episode. Wife gets scared. She thinks, I have an EpiPen. So the wife stabs her EpiPen into the patient. Patient wakes up a little bit. You know, his pressure might come up a little bit, has that nice Epi reaction. Uh, but by EMS arrival, the epinephrine's already wearing off and patient is once again altered and pooping and not doing too well. So besides just running the uh, anaphylactic guideline and recognizing anaphylaxis, I have a couple of notes in here about how long it takes for patients to respond to an allergen-induced reaction. And it all depends on how, what route that allergen got into the patient. So food allergies, on average, can take anywhere from five minutes to 30 minutes to start having a reaction. And that can actually extend all the way to two hours. And most studies have shown that if a patient hasn't had a reaction within two hours of having a food, they're not going to have a reaction. Those same studies also showed if a patient did have a reaction and we treated it, the patient is at risk for something called a biphasic reaction. And what that means is a uh, patient had a reaction I gave the epinephrine and Benadryl. The uh, allergen that caused the reaction is still in the system, right? I eat food. It takes me quite a long time to metabolize it. And until that food is entirely out of the system, 
I may have another response to that food after the medications you gave me wear off. So any patient that has an allergic reaction, especially a severe reaction, needs to be transported, needs to be seen by uh, hospital staff for an extended period of time to make sure the patient doesn't have that biphasic reaction. Unrelated to your scenario, the other types of um, allergens can be provided to patients, right? Bee stings and bug bites. So a couple of different studies I have in the notes. One of the studies uh, done in the UK had patients that sat in an office room and the researchers placed a stinging ant on the patient's forearm and then gave a painful stimulus to the ant so the ant would start stinging the person. They had it sting the person for a full one minute just to see how the patients reacted to the venom from these stinging ants. Uh, what they found that on average, patients started having anaphylactic reaction between two and 15 minutes with the average time being eight. Other studies have shown it usually takes between, again, uh, the other study said three to 15 minutes for a reaction to occur. Um, but another UK study showed that the average time for patients who were stung or bit to have respiratory cardiac arrest takes about 15 minutes. So we just need to be aware when we get called out for uh, bee sting or bug bites and stuff, by the time we arrive, patient might be on the way out. We might need to react extraordinarily quickly to prevent this patient from going into an arrest. The other route um, would be medication allergies. Um, and the only study that I found that had really good uh, uh, accounts of how long it took for reaction to occur were in hospital studies. And the drugs they gave were IV and IM. So that took five minutes on average for a patient to reach respiratory cardiac arrest secondary to an allergic reaction to a med, but those are meds that were put almost directly into a vascular system. So uh, oral medications will take a bit longer to start being metabolized, broken down for the body to recognize that that med shouldn't be in there and I'm gonna have a bad reaction to it. Um, besides talking about the amount of time it takes for these allergens to start reacting inside the system and how bad some of them can be, I don't have too much extra to talk about uh, for the debrief. Let me take a quick look through the notes again. Yeah, not too much. So again, just recognize hypotension and shock features are not mandatory for the diagnosis of anaphylaxis. Per your guidelines, depending on how you choose to read it, you might be more comfortable calling into med control saying, here's what I've got, here's what I wanna give an epi because um, your guidelines do specifically say hypotension and poor perfusion rather than signs of hypotension or poor perfusion. So by the letter of the law, you should consider calling in. Since you have guidelines um, rather than um, strict protocols, you could choose to uh, make the decision for your patient that it's more appropriate to give the up and effort when you have the opportunity to do so. I have notes in here, a couple of charts um, that just show what organ should be affected by anaphylactic and what the signs and symptoms are related to that organ system. And keep in mind for uh, anaphylactic diagnosis, it usually has to affect two organ systems. So I have respiratory distress and I have swelling in the airway, or I have GI symptoms and altered level of consciousness. So at least two organ systems should be involved with this. And then the final thing I would do, since you likely have the equipment out already for the scenario and you're working with your clinicians anyway, I would have them prep making that one to 100,000 epinephrine to provide that um, bolus for hypotension. And the reason I would do that just for practice now is because this is a no stress time to go ahead and practice some basic math. And I prefer that they practice it when there's no stress as opposed to having to do it for the first time when they have that critical patient in front of them and they're trying to remember the best way to go ahead and create a one to 100,000 dose of epinephrine. Page seven from the anaphylactic scenario, um, I would print that out and give it as a handout to your clinicians. The first chart on there is just the most common signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis and how commonly they show up for patients. And the second one is the 
I'll call it new definition for anaphylaxis. It really came out, uh, it was created between 2014, 2016, and it was published, I think, 2016, 2017. Um, but this is the um, nationally recognized definition of anaphylaxis and how we in the pre-hospital setting should be recognizing it. So just so they have something to take home to remember the uh, anaphylactic scenario. That's all I got for this one. If you guys have questions, obviously shoot me an email or contact Jen Shea, Matt Myler, Dr. Burnett. Uh, that's it. I'll see you guys later.